Welcome to the Ensemble Tropical Rainfall Potential, commonly abbreviated as ETRAP, training session. My name is Dan Bikus, and I'll be leading this training session designed for Shimet and Visit. The product development team is listed here, and the ETRAP product is currently available via a web page that we'll look at later. It's not available on AWIPS, however, there is a chance it could be in AWIPS 2 in the future since anything that is now produced in NAWIPS at NESDIS can be put into AWIPS 2. ETRAP is a satellite-based deterministic and probabilistic rainfall prediction for landfalling tropical cyclones. TRAP stands for Tropical Rainfall Potential, which is the base product, and ETRAP is an ensemble of traps. In order to better understand ETRAP, we will look briefly at TRAP first. TRAP is a forecast of rainfall for landfalling cyclones based on a long-track extrapolation of satellite-estimated rainfall rates. The goal of TRAP is to forecast where will the rainfall maximum occur and what will it be. The rainfall accumulation depends on rainfall intensity, size of the tropical cyclone rainfall, and the speed of the tropical cyclone. A snapshot of satellite-estimated rainfall rate is propagated forward in time following the predicted tropical cyclone track forecast. Every 15 minutes, a new position is calculated and the spatial rainfall rates applied over a grid. Then the 15-minute accumulations are summed over a period of 24 hours to produce a 24-hour forecast. Visualize the product as a time integral of satellite microwave sensor rain rates along a vector beginning at the pixel of interest and proceeding parallel to the predicted storm track, but in the opposite direction. The time integration is done in the opposite direction in order to get the timing right. From the perspective of a particular pixel, the rain at the part of the storm closest to me will reach me first, and the rain at the part of the storm farthest from me will reach me last as the storm passes over. A trap is generated by computing the aerial or spatially distributed rain rates from satellite-based passive microwave sensor. Then, using an operational forecast tropical cyclone track, evict the rainfall for 24 hours. The trap consists of four six-hour rainfall accumulation forecasts, which sum to the 24-hour total. Errors can be caused by any of these factors that are assumed. The first is the satellite estimated rainfall rates are accurate. The second is the forecast cyclone track is accurate. And the third is the rainfall rates over the 24-hour forecast track are steady state following the cyclone path. One way to reduce these errors is to average multiple traps valid at about the same time. This has an advantage in that the mean field is less likely to produce very large errors. However, the disadvantage is the averaging damps out the high rainfall rates. A better approach would be to retain information on the distribution of forecast within the ensemble, making use of uncertainty or variability among the trap forecast comprising the ensemble. Probabilistic forecast of rain exceeding certain critical thresholds in locations of interest are the desired product to analyze. ETRAP is made of satellite rain rates and track forecast using observations from several microwave sensors at two or more observation times within a six-hour time period and using several different track forecasts. The diversity among the ensemble members helps to reduce the large or unknown errors associated with a single sensor, single track trap. The large number of ensemble members allows probability forecast to be issued with good precision and probability. The number of ensemble members is typically large for the 24-hour accumulations, but may not be so large for the 6-hour accumulations, especially the ones later in the forecast. There are three primary benefits of using an ensemble approach. The first is reduction of random error gives more accurate estimates of spatial rainfall field. This includes the location of rain maximum, the maximum rain amount, and the rain volume. The result is less streaky than the single sensor trap. The next benefit is variability among individual traps calculated as part of the ensemble process gives some indication of the uncertainty associated with the forecast. 
And the third benefit is that the mapped probabilities of rainfall exceeding critical thresholds allows more informed decisions. Weights are assigned to various members of the ensemble. The weights shown here are based on the fact that shorter term forecasts have more skill than longer term forecasts. The weights for the various satellite sensors are all equal and assigned to be one. ETRAP ensemble members are combined to produce two products, QPF and probability of precipitation exceeding threshold values over the forecast time period, which is 6 or 24 hours. For the QPF product, the number of ensemble members is reduced, but the distribution is transformed using probability, that is histogram matching, to have the same distribution as the full ensemble. The purpose of this transformation is to remove the excess light rain caused by the averaging process and to restore the heavy rain accumulations that may have been lost during the averaging. Here's the ETRAP homepage listed at the top here. And then below that, we have a screenshot of what the web page looks like. And what I'm going to do next is just describe the various parts of the web page so we understand the product. At the top here, we have the product and digital format information. Over here on the left, we have the storm basin and the storm name. And then over here on the right in the red circle, we have the six hourly deterministic e-traps for the next 24 hours. And in this box here, we have the six hourly probabilistic e-traps for the next 24 hours. And then down here in this red circle, we have the 24 hour deterministic e-trap and the corresponding 24-hour probabilistic e-traps listed in this box. And then down here at the bottom, we have the storm archive so that you can go back and look at uh, previous storms. Next, we will show you how to display a QPF and also a probability of precipitation exceeding threshold product. Note at the top, this is for Tropical Cyclone Parma in October 2009. First, we'll select a probability of precipitation exceeding threshold product. Use the column and row titles to help you identify which product to view. In the red circle, we show the image that corresponds to the zero to six hour forecast period. See the row title on the left. And the probability of precipitation exceeding 25 millimeters. See the column title on the top. Click on the image, which will show up on the following slide. Here is the image that would have displayed in your web browser upon clicking upon that red circle that we looked at from the previous slide. Now we will select a QPF product for Tropical Cyclone Parma. In the red circle, we show the image that corresponds to the zero to six hour forecast period. See the row title on the left. And the rain amount, or QPF, see the column title on the top. Click on the image, and we'll look at what comes up on the following slide. Here's the image displayed after clicking what was shown on the previous slide. How long does it take for the product to be available to users? Well, an e-trap will be produced centered on the synoptic hours of 0, 6, 12, and 18z from single orbit trap segments with start times within three hours of the synoptic hour. Storms are processed sequentially 10 to 15 minutes each, so exact dissemination time will depend on the number of storms and a particular storm's place in the sequence. E-traps will thus be available between three hours and 10 minutes to four hours after the nominal valid time. Here's an example from Hurricane Rita. We're looking at various E-TRAP products for the 24-hour forecast period, valid 0Z, 25 September 2005. In the upper left, we have the ensemble mean QPF, which is simply the weighted average of the ensemble members at every grid box in the domain. Each grid box is a quarter degree latitude by longitude and size. In the upper center, we have the probability matched ensemble mean. This is the product you will see displayed on the web page under rain amount. As we discussed earlier, the probability matched mean is preferred since it removes the excess light rain and restores heavy rain accumulations that may have been lost in the averaging process. 
The probability of exceedance thresholds are given in the remaining panels. These are weighted on the premise that shorter-term forecasts have more skill than longer-term forecasts, so that greater influence is given to ensemble members with greater expected accuracy. The thresholds chosen for probabilistic forecast are 50, 100, 150, and 200 millimeters for the 24-hour forecast period, while for the 6-hour forecast periods, the thresholds are 25, 50, 75, and 100 millimeters. Here's an ETRAP QPF from Hurricane Rita over a 24-hour period, and we'll have along with that the accompanying observed rainfall over the same time period from the Stage 4 rainfall analysis. It is readily apparent that ETRAP identified the region of greatest risk to heavy rain. For Tropical Storm Claudette, we see an ETRAP QPF maximum over a 24-hour period of 175 millimeters in the Florida Panhandle. The observed rainfall maximum over the same time period was about 125 millimeters. In this case, the ETRAP overestimate was due to the assumption of steady rainfall rates over a 24-hour period not being met. An increase in upper-level shear and a dry air intrusion led to the decrease in rainfall rates during the forecast time period. Taking into account forecast parameters in combination with ETRAP can lead to a better forecast than just using ETRAP alone. Rainfall proximity to storm center is another forecast consideration when looking at ETRAP forecasts. Usually the farther away the satellite-derived rain rates are from the storm center, the lower the confidence of the ETRAP results. In this example of Tropical Depression Ida, we see ETRAP QPF maximum amounts of 250 millimeters in northeast Alabama. The observed maximum rainfall amounts were around 150 millimeters. This was due to the tropical depression undergoing tr extratropical transition during the forecast period. Therefore, this weakening trend resulted in reduced rainfall rates. The basic assumption not met here is steady rainfall rates over 24 hours. The rainfall rates are further from the storm center due to extratropical transition, which typically results in a less accurate ETRAP forecast. The validation study is based on 2004 to 2008 Atlantic Basin tropical cyclones. The probability of precipitation exceeding threshold values tends to be high, in other words, overconfident. Performance is better for lighter thresholds and long accumulations, and performance is poorer for heavier thresholds and short accumulations. For more details, you can check out the AMS preprint, which is listed on this link below. Let's look at recent changes to ETRAP as of the end of November 2013. First, replacement of SSMI with SSMIS data. Also, addition of Global Hydro Estimator, that's GHE, members to the ensemble. And also, we'll look at calibration of ETRAP probabilities. Let's look at the addition of GHE to the ensemble. The motivation is ETRAP runs only if greater than or equal to two ensemble members are available for each lead time. ETRAP availability in the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific basins has been about 50%. So the problem always occurs at the 18 to 24 hour lead since the only ETRAP members at that lead are going to be from the most recent forecast. At shorter leads, we also have six-hour segments from the previous forecast track to work with. But without the 18 to 24-hour lead, there's no zero to 24-hour forecast either, so no ETRAP. The solution is to add traps based on GHE rainfall estimates to the ensemble. That is, the GHE is based on IR data from geostationary satellites worldwide, and one-hour GHE totals available every hour at all locations. So traps are produced every hour for every storm. IR-based rainfall estimates have issues for tropical systems since they can't see through the central dense overcast and thus miss a lot of the detailed structure that microwave traps capture. As a result, traps produced using one-hour GHE totals have a root mean square error about 5% higher than 
for the microwave-based traps, while the equitable threat score is 5 to 10 percent lower. Also, the GHE traps are multiplied by 0.7 to remove a wet bias. So the objective was to use enough GHE members to allow us to consistently create an ensemble, but not enough to degrade the forecast. The more ensemble members we have, the, the better the probability resolution. If we have only two ensemble members, the only possible probabilities are 0, 50, and 100 percent, whereas with eight members, the possible probabilities are 0, 12.5, 25, 37.5, then going up to 100 percent. Actually, the the probability values will vary a bit more than that because the different members will have different weights, but this gets the idea across. The E-trap probabilities are just the weighted fraction of ensemble members that exceed a threshold at a given pixel. The E-trap probabilities are biased too high, so a downward adjustment is made to remove the bias. The reliability diagram on the right shows the overconfidence and how it increases with intensity. That is, an 80% probability of 25 millimeters of rain at the pixel scale verifies about 50% of the time, but at 100 millimeters, an 80% probability almost never verifies. It's not that it never rains 100 millimeters, it's that the 80% probability of 25 millimeters is usually in the wrong place and so rarely overlaps the actual 25 millimeter ISO Hyatt. This is why it's critical for the users to understand that these probabilities apply to each pixel and not a neighborhood probability. Forecast probabilities should not be taken at face value. If we interpret the probability forecast to mean the chance of exceeding the threshold rain in that pixel, then the forecast probabilities for 6 hours and 24 hours were too high, with better performance for lighter thresholds and long accumulations, and poorer performance for heavier thresholds and short accumulations. Since the probabilities cannot be taken at face value, then calibration should be applied to improve their reliability. For example, the calibrated probabilities indicated by the center column in each table match the observed frequency in the right column much better than the uncalibrated probabilities which are indicated in the left column. However, this significantly reduces the maximum possible probability value. For the 100 millimeter and 6 hour threshold on the right, the probability never exceeds 13 percent. You have to keep this in mind when interpreting the guidance. Keep in mind that these are probabilities for an 8 by 8 kilometer grid box. Low probabilities do not mean low threat. If the QPE value is high while the probability is low, this implies that there is significant uncertainty about where it will occur, not about that it will occur somewhere. The low probabilities are the result of low confidence in that location, that is the rainfall will exceed the threshold value at exactly the 8 by 8 kilometer grid box of interest. So the high QPF values should be taken as reliable forecast of the magnitude of the heaviest rainfall from the storm. But the low threshold probabilities reflect the uncertainty in exactly where it will happen. The lower the threshold probabilities for a given corresponding QPF value, the lower the confidence in the location. Forecasters need to keep this in mind when interpreting the probability guidance. Forecasters should also interpret the low probabilities in the context of climatology. That is, for a rainfall amount with a three-year recurrence interval, the, prob the probability of it occurring on any given day is approximately 0.01%. So a 10% probability would be 100 times higher than climatology and is thus worthy of attention. Future improvements include adding R Clipper, which is the rainfall climatology parametric model, to include effects such as shear and topography. Storm consolidation, this ensures that E-trap members are kept together when storm name changes, for example, from a numbered tropical depression to a named tropical storm. Modifications to the trap forecast, including topographic enhancement of trap land-based rainfall estimates, also include effects of storm rotation, 
Uh, Lou et al. in 2008 included estimates of storm rotation from geostationary cloud drift winds in past trap extrapolation forecasts and found that this enhancement alone reduced the mean absolute errors by 40 percent compared to other trap forecasts. That means there's some possibility for uh, significant improvements there. And then also uh, sensors on future satellites. That concludes our training session. Now let's review some of the more important points from the training. ETRAP provides predictions of 6 and 24 hour rainfall amount and probabilities of exceeding various thresholds for rain and land falling tropical cyclones. ETRAP offers the possibility to provide probabilistic forecasts for decision makers. The more forecasters understand the assumptions that go into the traps that produce an ETRAP, the better they will be able to modify their final tropical rainfall forecast. If you have any questions or comments, my email address is listed down at the bottom.